Given that title, I wonder what you might be expecting. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. It'd be interesting just, just to think about what you think that title is going to be held in and to see how, <laughs> how what I'm going to do meets that expectation. Okay, first of all, just a, a bit of background. O- obviously, uh, in this country, we've had a whole group of people who've come to be called now the New Atheists. Uh, Anthony Flew, who is uh, one of the old atheists, who has recently become a, a deist, uh, you know, just in the last few years, has said, uh, come to the position where he admits that there must be some kind of intelligence behind the universe. Uh, and he says the difference between the old New Atheists and the and the new atheists is that his generation of old atheists were civil and polite people who wanted to debate with Christians. And the new atheists, new atheists says, are um, rude, um, <laughs> aggressive, and really don't want to have serious debate. Anyway, so that's, that's his judgment. And of course, the new atheist, most well known, of course, Richard Dawkins, he, officially the professor of public understanding of science, uh, though of course he's just retired. And we now know who his successor is going to be. The successor is a a popular mathematician who has said that he's not going to be anything like Dawkins. Uh, So so that era is over, thankfully, for the time being. But uh, as you all know, he's been really the professor of the public promotion of atheism for many years. And there he is in his Atheist for Jesus T-shirt, photographed on the Galapagos Islands. And, of course, his famous book of, not science, of course, but theology or anti-theology, I suppose you might call it. Anyway, here, here's some of the other of the media new atheists. Uh, can anyone tell me who they are, starting from the right-hand side? Oh, yes, it's David Attenborough. The one in the middle. One of Dawkins' colleagues at Oxford. Peter. Yes, it's Peter Atkins. Uh, physics professor there, and uh, even more aggressive atheist than Dawkins, if that's possible. One on the f- far side, not so well known, but uh, r- uh, appears in the papers quite often writing articles. He's British, but he's actually in New York at the, at the moment. And so he's not quite so well known, but it's a, a guy called Nicholas Humphrey, psychologist, psychology professor. But uh, again, one of the aggressive new atheists. How about these? Uh, the top one nearest me? That's Steven Pinker. Writes a lot on language issues. Uh, the one next to him at the top? Yes. yes, that's Steve Jones from London University. Uh, again, writes a great deal in the, the papers and appears on the, uh, the media. Uh, the one at the bottom nearest me? Again, fairly well known. From London again. Uh, that's uh, Lewis Volpert, biologist. Again, quite aggressive. The one at the bottom is an, an American philosopher. Daniel yeah, it's Daniel Dennett. Yeah. Um, there, there are plenty more. I mean, if you take those who have written uh, well-known books, then here's a actually a graduate student, Sam Harris. Uh, wrote a letter to a Christian nation most recently, and then a book called The End of Faith before that. Again, um, uh, it's interesting. It, you, some of you probably have followed the, the Michael Rice affair, the... Um, Education Director of the Royal Society, who was uh, effectively sacked because he was, uh, a lecture he gave in Liverpool just a month ago was interpreted uh, as him saying that creationists ought to be tolerated. Uh, he wasn't saying that, but uh, in the mere suggestion, the mere interpretation was enough to, for him to lose his, his uh, job. And um, <clears throat> I lost what I was going to say there, but... Uh, Ah, yes, yes. Um, one of the fellows of the Royal Society, one of the other prominent atheists in this country, a guy called Harry Croto, chemistry Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he, he said that um, uh, all Christian and church schools ought to give Sam Harris's book to read to give them a proper education. And then uh, another one called Christopher Hitchens, again, well-known media person. And his book, God is Not Great, deliberately targeted Muslims, of course, as well as, as Christians. So plenty of them. Anyway, change the topic. Who's this? It's uh, the comedian, Paul Merton. Uh, I put him up because uh, ju- just very recently, in fact, um, might still be going for I know, 
He's had a series on the television, Paul Merton in India. And um, uh, fascinatingly, the very first episode here, he went to a temple in India where they worship rats. And that's my question. Who's afraid of rat um, worshippers? And it's quite fascinating because uh, he was absolutely blown away by this. Um, let me show you it. There's the temple. It's quite a small temple, the Karni Mata Temple in Rajasthan. And um, that's this solid silver door of the, the temple and shows the, the particular goddess and her servants are rats that support this uh, goddess. And in the temple they keep thousands of of rats and uh, they are being fed on buffalo milk. Uh, quite amazing. And so Paul Merton was just absolutely blown away by, by this and um, the devotees of this goddess in the temple will you know, take milk from that same dish that the rats are feeding from to drink. And say, uh, you know, it's especially invigorating this milk that the rats have been drinking and they offered it to, to Paul Merton and um, he wisely, I think, declined. Or he saved himself from having a sixth uh, tummy for many weeks. Um, but he, he obviously didn't know how to respond to this. Um, you know, clearly, you know, he was a religious faith. There was nothing hidden or secret about it. This was some kind of religion in action. Uh, but obviously, there the are not, relatively speaking, many believers in this particular religion. And it's clearly no threat uh, you know, to anyone in, in the Western world. You know, these people are not going to go out and plant bombs or anything like that. And so how should he respond to this? And, and on the program he says, well, you know, everyone's entitled to their religion. It's obviously true for them. That was his response. And you clearly, you know, that's an, an easy get out. It saves you from any further engagement, that kind of postmodernist response. You don't have to engage with this religion. You don't have to... Uh, you can just leave it, leave it like that. But of course, not all religions are like that. You can't do that. I, what I want to talk about tonight... Oh, I'm going the wrong way. That's it. That's it. Yeah, let me go on. What I want to talk about tonight is uh, another religion which I think is uh, much more dangerous than that one because... It has followers throughout the world who are very committed and are some of the most intolerant and aggressive proponents of religion to be found. And the one I want to talk about tonight is actually held by this person in particular. Do anyone know who this is? It's a guy called Eric Harris. Yeah, this is one of the Columbine killers from the United States in, I think it was April 1999, who, who went into a college with his, with his friend and killed, I think it was 12 students. We'll, we'll come back to it later. And um, afterwards, of course, you know, when people started to look at his diary and his, and he kept a diary and he kept notebooks to see just what motivated motivate this fellow, this is what they found that he wrote just days before the slaughter. Only science and math are real. Just because your mummy and daddy tell you blood and violence is bad, you think it's a effing law of nature. Wrong. Only science and math are true. Everything else, and I mean everything effing else, is man-made. He believed that. And took it to his logical conclusion. Who is to say he shouldn't do anything? And that's why I want to put a sort of big explanation mark because what I want to, to suggest to you tonight is that there is no neutrality in our world. And that includes there is no neutral science. That even science, that supposedly objective neutral science, is always embedded in some kind of worldview, some kind of faith. And that worldview, that faith, is always the expression of some kind of philosophical view of reality. And the dominant philosophy today is actually the one that Eric Harris was living out there. It's the one which we often call materialism. Well, actually, because there are 
This is one of the things we can't go into tonight. There are, of course, actually different varieties of materialism, but uh, I'm talking about secular atheistic materialism. And that's where I just need to digress for a moment, just ask that question, what is atheism? Because uh, you know, you've got Dawkins, Hitchens, and all, all the others that we just uh, glanced at before, all saying that they are atheists. Because atheism, is, in fact, is, is rather like being a vegetarian. That is, all it actually tells you is what they don't believe. And to be a vegetarian tells you that, that people don't eat meat. But that still leaves open quite a range of different kinds of diet that they might uh, you know, have. So we always have to ask the question, well, what kind of vegetarian are you? you know, can we give you eggs? Can we give you milk? Can we, you know, whatever. And you have to find out what kind of vegetarian the, the person actually is. But atheism is rather like that. Someone claims they're an atheist. All that tells you is they don't believe in a god. But then the question you have to ask, that's a negative. What do they believe? What is their actual commitment? And that's you know, where all those atheists we're talking about, are not, it shouldn't really be called atheists, because that's, that doesn't tell you anything. What they all are, of course, is materialists. And what that means, just to spell it out, that they believe that physical nature is all there is. But there's nothing else beyond that. But there's no immaterial realm beyond physical detection. In other words, no spirit, soul, angels, God, or anything else like that. And also, that there is no intelligence, design, or purpose behind or at work in the universe. Those are all things that have evolved and come into being, perhaps only with humankind. Perhaps nowhere else. No other source. That's our materialist. Oops, what's happened here? Right. Okay. Now, this materialism is claims the objectivity of modern science. That's one of the problems with it. That although it is actually, as we shall see, very definitely a kind of religious commitment, yet of course it doesn't present itself like that. It presents itself with all the objectivity of modern science, and it projects an image of neutrality and often of sweet liberal liberalism of tolerance. But by hiding its religious commitment, what I want to suggest, it becomes very persuasive and very seductive and also, therefore, very dangerous. So the questions I'm going to be looking at tonight as we carry on through is, there, is there actually nothing credulous about secular materialism? And is it, in fact, dangerous? So that's the questions. Because secular materialism usually avoids completely being interrogated. And one of the things I'm, I'm sure many of you ask me that has been so infuriating by these endless series that Richard Dawkins does on the television, whether it's religion, the root of all evil, or, or, or some of the others that he's done, is that every other position is subject to criticism, but at no point in any of the programmes does he allow anyone to raise critical questions about secular materialism itself, about his atheistic position. Uh, even though, as we know in some of these programmes, he did actually engage with people who could give him a run for his money. For example, you know, the question was often asked, why in those programmes called the root of all religion, the root of all evil, did he only engage with cranks and extreme figures representing the religions? Why didn't he engage with you know, someone like Alistair McGrath from Oxford or Keith Ward from Oxford? You know, really competent Christian scholars who could have really given him a run for his money. And you know what the answer is? He did. But all that was left on the cutting room floor. It was never included in the broadcast. So that's what we're up against. So tonight I want to take the opportunity to ask some of those critical questions that are usually evaded. But first of all, just to say... You don't have to look very hard to find the way in which that materialism is a faith at work. Just take a few examples. Who's this? Oh dear me, we're not doing very well in general knowledge tonight. Good job this is not a pub quiz. <laughs> this is Fred Hoyle, the astronomer. Um, uh, he, he was 
uh, those two states. Um, he was one with, in fact, with, three other, with two other scientists who put forward the steady state theory uh, in astronomy and cosmology. In, in fact, I think it was 1948. And here are the three of them. Three atheists, Thomas Gold, Herman Bondi, and there's Fred Hoyle. And that's a, a photograph taken about somewhere around about 1960. Three atheists. And in fact, um, I'm not sure at Thomas Gold, but certainly Herman Bondi and Fred Hoyle were quite clear and explicit and open about the fact that the reason they put forward the steady state theory was to avoid the creationist implications of the Big Bang theory. And they were quite open and explicit about that. So there was a, you know, a clear example, a mitted example, of where materialism as a theory worked in that way you know, to direct science on the basis of no evidence whatsoever, just a religious commitment. Uh, but interesting, before we leave Fred Hoyle, we should say that times change. And in the 1960s, when he was researching the way in which elements build up in the universe, he became totally amazed by, by the incredible fine-tuning that he was finding in chemistry and physics. And so though he, if he never became a theist or Christian, he'd still nevertheless changed his mind to the position that there must be an intelligence at work. Everything is too uh, finely tuned. And so he wrote in 1982, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. And of course, much more recently, we've had another atheist uh, philosopher, um, Anthony uh, Flew, who has made a, a similar statement. Anyway, here's another of these atheists where faith was clearly at work. Anyone know who this one is? Right, okay. <laughs> this is Francis Crick, the, the biologist, you know, one of those who discovered the structure of, of DNA uh, back in 1953. Uh, and People think he was a, a great scientist. Mark Stein described him as the most important biologist of the 20th century. Robin McKee as uh, one of the greatest scientists ever. And Matt Ridgely, that he, that he must eventually be bracketed with Galileo, Deo, uh, Darwin and Einstein. So someone reckoned to be one of the greatest uh, scientists. And he wrote statements like this uh, in one of his uh, last books, you, he wrote, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of identity and free will are in fact no more than the behaviour of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. And uh, he, he again was quite explicit that the only reason that he went into the areas of biology he did and came up with the theories he did was because he was an atheist and was seeking a materialistic interpretation and theory. Again, he was quite explicit about that. And, uh, you know, just some uh, you know, stories about him. Uh, soon after he discovered with James Watson the structure of DNA, he was invited to become a, a fellow of Churchill College, Cambridge, one of the newest Cambridge colleges. And um, he became a fellow on the condition that it would never have a chapel. Uh, you know, it was practically the only uh, Cambridge college which didn't have a chapel. But then, not many years after he became a, a fellow, a rich donor came along and offered Cambridge uh, all the money to build a chapel. And of course, all his fellow, uh, fellows thought this was a great idea. You know, no cost, all provided. And um, they said, well, you know, you don't have to go to the college. And they had the college, they had the chapel built as far away from the rest of the college as possible, but they accepted the money. Uh, Francis Crick was absolutely horrified and uh, you know, said he just could not accept this. Um, but they went ahead and took the money and built this chapel, and here it is, there's the chapel, built at the far end of the, the college grounds. So Francis Crick then offered to put up all the money to, to build a brothel um, next to it. And when, they and when the rest of the fellows refused, he resigned from the college. <laughs> so that's the kind of um, aggressive atheist he was. 
And uh, here's a conversation that, that's recorded by Horace Judson in September 1971. An important reason Crick changed to biology, he said to me. He was a, I think he was a, originally in, uh, what was he in originally? I've forgotten. Uh, but he, he wasn't in biology originally. An important reason Crick changed to biology, he said to me, was that he is an atheist and was impatient to throw light into the remaining sanctuaries of vitalistic illusions. Or as he said to another friend, he wanted to drive, bio, uh, drive God out of science. Okay. And then, of course, Dawkins. Um, again, Dawkins is another atheist who's been quite open about the fact that uh, he has virtually a religious commitment to, to, uh, to Darwinism. And it's as you look at Dawkins' thought, you realise that Darwinism is not just the theory of natural selection applied to origins. Uh, if it was simply that, there wouldn't be much to worry about. Uh, but for both its original author, Charles Darwin, and Charles Darwin was quite clear. It's quite clear when you read Darwin's notebooks and letters that uh, Darwin became a, a convinced materialist and then looked for a theory that was compatible with his materialism. So both its original author, Charles Darwin, and its leading modern proponents, um, most of those I've shown before, the one at the, the top and the far side is John Maynard Smith, another famous atheist biologist. But for all of those, their adherence to Darwinism because it is the materialistic theory of origins. And that was, again, quite clear for all those people. And so Darwinism is the Western religion's materialistic origins myth. Now, it's not to say, of course, it doesn't um, have a, a genuine kind of scientific role as well, but for all these people, it's primarily its role as uh, support for their materialism. And so we have Dawkins. Here he is wearing his Evolution, the greatest show on earth, the only game in town T-shirt. And... Uh, by evolution, of course, Dawkins always means Darwinism, materialism. But what does materialism mean? And as an example here, I, I want to take a very famous song by John Lennon, his song Imagine, from 1971. Uh, here are just a few of the words of it. They're, they're just the first stanza. Imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. And so it goes on. It's amazing, he, even how on Wiki, Wikipedia it's, it's described as you know, a great uh, poem about peace and harmony in the world. And of course, that's not really what it's about. It's an atheist piece of propaganda. But it's a very nice way of understanding just what materialism means. It means that above us there is only sky. There are just particles moving about, no right or wrong, just whatever happens. That's what materialism means. There is nothing else there. And that brings two crucial points to remember, that most people, whether Christians or unbelievers, just don't seem to get it. That Christians generally appear to be unaware of the extent to which materialistic assumptions now shape people and our society. It really is the religion, the underlying religion of people today. And again, I'm not talking about what people might say, even in many cases what they might think, but what is actually revealed by the way they live, the way they live as if there is no God, as if there is only sky. That's what we're talking about. It's what is actually manifested in the way people live. But then, and this is the thing I want to concentrate on uh, really this evening, many atheists find it very difficult to accept, to believe, what it would really mean to live in a godless world. In other words, if, this, if materialism really is true, what does that mean? And what I want to show tonight is actually most of these new atheists don't have the courage of their convictions. They constantly draw on Christian assumptions which they have no right to. And without those Christian assumptions, their whole worldview wouldn't work. 
But let's look at it. So it asks the question again, what does materialism mean? But this time in a different way. And here are four features of the new atheist materialism. A very reductionist view of people, of human beings. No plausible anchor for truth and morality. No justification for them. An irrational faith in science, what's often called scientism by the philosophers, and an aggressive intolerance of religion. Now, I'm only going to look at the first two tonight because um, there simply isn't time to go through them all. So it's these two I'm going to look at. A reductionist view of people and no plausible anchor for truth and morality. And we start with that reductionist view of people. So here's Dawkins, of course. We are survival machines, he writes, robot vehicles, blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. Right? Fine. That's as clear a materialist statement as you could wish for. Or again, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if it is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Yeah, no problem. That's a perfectly consistent statement of his materialist position. Fine. Above us, there's only sky. You know, he's spelt out in a bit more detail and a bit, a bit more interestingly, but that's essentially what he said. Above us, there's only sky. And, you know, go back to that same from Francis Crick. You, your joys and your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of identity, your free will, are in fact no more than the behaviour of a vast assembly of nerve cells and associated molecules. And that's all they are. Perfectly straightforward materialist statement. Or Stephen Pinker. Neuroscience has shown us that our intelligence and emotions consists of the intricate patterns of activity in the trillions of connections in our brain, and that's all they are. And following Pinker's statement, uh, this is a letter that appeared in Time. I'm not sure I'll ever have the same degree of self-respect now that I know I'm just an illusion created by 100 billion jabbering neurons. <laughs> OK, but, you know, it's a fair comment. Given that materialist position, that's the truth of the matter. Sometimes, because we go even further, this is Dr. Eric Pianca. Uh, he was the 2006 Distinguished Texas Scientist. So, you know, every year the state of Texas recognizes one of its scientists as the Distinguished Scientist of the Year. And at his acceptance speech, he made uh, this statement, we're no better than bacteria. Again, uh, if materialism is true, then it's difficult to argue that we are. What right are we to like more than bacteria or, or anything else? If you sort of spell out his argument in more detail, it goes something like this. All organisms begin as cells. Cells are only complex chemistry. All chemical complexes are equal, ontologically anyway. So why should any particular chemical complex, human, be given any particular status greater than that of another chemical complex, cat or bacteria. And of course we know that biochemically, physiologically, uh, you find even the so-called simplest organisms are pretty much on the same level of complexity as the highest. Uh, incidentally, I, I'm not obviously going to look at any of these tonight, but just be aware that those are the kind of worldview assumptions that are at work in debates on genetic modification, cloning, stem cells, animal-human hybrids, and so on. It's no good getting to, into any of those debates unless you dig out the worldviews of the people who are arguing and presenting. Because they come from a materialist position. They're also going to be coming from a very different position than, say, uh, a Christian. And, and if you don't deal with those worldview issues, the debate will go nowhere. But go back to Eric Pianka. What was he getting at by saying we know better than bacteria? Well, he was arguing that there were far too many people, that we were having a terrible damaging effect on all other species. But, but again, one has to immediately ask the question, why should that be a problem? 
on the materialist assumption, you know, materialists will say that perhaps 99.999% of all organisms that have ever been have gone extinct. So why should that be a problem? But anyway, leave that aside for the moment. He believes that the human population needs to be reduced by at least 90%. War and famine are far too slow, he reckons. And Ebola plague, that's the um, flesh-dissolving virus infection, would probably be ideal. Now, I should say straight away, he was not for one moment suggesting that anyone should go out and do any such thing. So, so let's you know, be quite clear on that. No one's accusing him of that. But, but nevertheless, that was his, his argument. And so we do have scientists like him, and he's far from being the only one, who would argue that humans do not differ in any essential way from apes, snakes, fish, or bacteria. To suggest otherwise is speciesism. You've probably heard that, that term. That, of course, there is no free will. Uh, if we're just those robot chemical machines that Dawkins go talk about, then, of course, the reason we do things is determined by our chemistry and physics and everything else maybe all the way back to the Big Bang, but determined nevertheless. We're wholly determined by our, our biology, and behind that, our physics and chemistry. But, as I suggested earlier on, many atheists, in fact, find it very difficult to accept that. They profess it, yet at the same time, they really believe the opposite. Richard Dawkins, the statement right at the end of his selfish gene book, this is taken from the second edition, but I think it's in the first edition as well. We are built as gene machines and cultured as meme machines. Memes is this idea that cultural artifacts, ideas, theories, language, whatever, uh, are passed on just like genes and are subject to natural selection in the same kind of, of way. So we're built as gene machines and cultured as meme machines. You know, we're completely determined by that biology, that cultural influence. Right? Good materialist. Sorry. And then suddenly, Dawkins says, but we have the power to turn against our creators. We alone on earth can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators. And you ask, ask the question, Dawkins, you still believe in the tooth fairy? Where on earth did that come from? Either materialism is true or it isn't. We're either determined by chemistry, our physics, our biology, or we're not. You can't have it both ways. And Dawkins nowhere in any and he's been challenged on this repeatedly, but has never given a response. And immediately, as soon as he's back on a program where he has control, never allows it to be raised. As to how a gene machine can rebel. And even if it could, how would it know it was? And if you want to actually read a secularist who really takes Dawkins and Co. to task for this, then read John Gray. He is a professor at uh, London School of Economics. He's not a Christian, not a theist. Uh, he's a secularist of some sort. And yet he's quite open about exposing just what the weakness is of materialism. And his book, Straw Dog, strange title, uh, Thoughts on Humans and Our Animals, but it's a wonderful expose. Of, the, of secularism and materialism. Uh, but it's quite open and it's, it's frustrating because you get right in the book and you wonder, well, how is he going to get out of this? And he doesn't. The book just finishes. Okay, no plausible anchor for truth and morality. Again, that quote from Dawkins, I won't read it again. It's the one we put up before. We dance to the, the tune of, of DNA. Above us, only sky. And of course... There have been various atheists down through history who have been aware that there's a real problem here. Here's Darwin himself. In 1881, just shortly before he died, with me he wrote in a letter, I think it's to uh, William Graham, with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind? if there are any convictions in such a mind. Which is the true view of the world? The way humans see it, or apes see it, or pigeons see it, or tortoises see it, or a dinosaur might have seen it? And how on materialistic assumptions can you possibly know? J.B.S. Haldane, another free-thinking atheist, 
expand it like this. If my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. They may be sound chemically, but that does not make them sound logically. You know, there's no connection between logic and chemistry. And hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of, of atoms. Now, here's where I want to just pause to ask that question. What are our children learning in school? I mean, in education, we often talk about what we call the hidden curriculum. The explicit curriculum is what's actually written in the syllabus or in the textbooks. But there's also the hidden curriculum. And that simply means what is it that's implicit in the way they're being taught, in what they're being taught? What's the worldview there? Because children will infallibly pick up that worldview, even though it's never explicitly mentioned. And the problem in most of our education today is that materialistic assumptions run right the way through school syllabi. Even Christian teachers, as I've discovered time and time again, are teaching those assumptions without realising they're there. But those assumptions will be picked up. And we'll look at some examples soon of children who have indeed picked up those assumptions. They've never been taught them explicitly. But because they're there implicitly, they've picked them up. Is the hidden curriculum of school and media that of materialism? And therefore, will children conclude that truth and morality are just opinions that teachers and other authority figures tell them they ought to accept? But clearly, on the basis of that implicit materialism, are just opinions. Opinions that have changed in their own history in recent years. And therefore opinions they can choose to accept or reject and no one to say otherwise. Does it matter? Let's look at some quick examples. Who likes 40 towers? Oh, I'm glad of that. I was absolutely horrified, what was it, a year or so ago when they had that um, program looking at the 50 best um, comedy programs and, and choosing which is the greatest comedy of all time. And uh, I would certainly say it was 40 Towers. There were only 12 episodes, but I think they're just unsurpassed. And, but it was, uh, what was it, Only Fools and Horses, wasn't it, that, that won that competition. I think 40 Towers was third. Travesty, but never mind. But the, there's one particular episode of that um, I want to look at. It's, um, it's the one where... Basil Fawlty, John Cleese, um, takes his car out and the car breaks down. <laughs> and you remember that episode? I mean, there it is. The car breaks down and you remember how it goes? Uh, he, you know, talks sternly to his car and orders it to pull itself together and start. Nothing happens. And so again, he... Uh, talks even more sternly to his car, ordering it to pull its socks up and get started. Nothing happens. I can't remember how many times he did it in the thing. I think it was about three times he does it. And then he just loses his cool completely, grabs a branch, which happens to be conveniently lying there, and starts thrashing the living daylights out of the, the car. You know, humour, British humour at its best. Wonderful stuff. Um... Yet Richard Dawkins wrote an article based on that episode. Uh, it was in 2006 where uh, one of the um, people who publishes a lot of the atheist books uh, had put forward the idea, he asked what he regarded as, I think it was 100 of the top intellectuals in the world, including Dawkins, what would be their most dangerous idea? And this is Dawkins' answer. And uh, you know, this is meant to be you know, serious. And Dawkins meant it seriously. Let's all stop beating Basil's car, he wrote. And uh, here's an extended quote from that article. Why do we not react? You know, we, we laugh at Basil beating his car. Why do we not react in the same way to a defective man? Is it the murderer or the rapist just a machine with a defective component? You know, he's been a real materialist here. He's following it through. Or a defective upbringing, 
or defective education or defective genes, why is it that we humans find it almost impossible to accept such conclusions? Because that's the point I'm making. These atheists, at the end of the day, do not accept their own materialist assumptions. But Dawkins is actually spelling it out here. Why do we vent such visceral hatred on child murderers or on foggish vandals when we should simply regard them as 40 units that need fixing or replacing? But that's materialist. That's a materialist position. And Dawkins meant it quite seriously. He's come back to it uh, you know, a, a few times since. That's the implication. Materialism declares that only physical nature exists, and so it is not possible to speak about purpose, goodness and wickedness. Evil is an illusion. They're just people who commit evil. There's no such thing. They're, they're just faulty machines. Mind you, that raises the question, how, how do we judge what's a good machine? But anyway, things like good, evil, just don't hook on to anything in that materialist world. At the end of the day, there are simply animals struggling to survive, and that's all there is. Now, what I was then going on to, to say was just look at some examples in films and literature of, of where this is again brought out. One of the persons actually wrote a, one of the best books on the philosophy of science, history of science, was a, a Hungarian man called Arthur Kerstler. But he also wrote a very famous novel in 1940 called Darkness at Noon. Has anyone read it? Arthur Kerstler's Darkness at Noon? It probably used to be a, a book that would be on the syllabi in schools, but it's probably like many books, just never read in schools now. But it's a story that, you know, of the time of the Russian Revolution and afterwards. And it tells the story of one of the old guard, guard uh, Bolshevik revolutionaries. You know, who was one of those involved in the communist takeover of uh, Russia and the establishment of the communist regime. And yet, eventually, those original Bolsheviks fell out of favour. And Rubashov, the, the main character in the story, as Arthur Kersler tells it, uh, you know, was first of all cast out of the party, then he was arrested, and finally he was tried for treason. And at one point, uh, his interrogator, uh, a man called Ivanov, Ivanov says, every year several million people are killed quite pointlessly by epidemics and other natural catastrophes. And we should shrink from sacrificing a few hundred thousand for the most promising experiment in history. Now, I say, Rubashov is horrified at this. But as I say, he can't express his revulsion. He must say, but that's wrong. But he can't. As a materialist, he hasn't got the vocabulary. He wants to say, but that's evil. But he can't. As a materialist, he hasn't got that vocabulary. And so he can't answer. And, uh, you know, as the story unfolds, he's revulsed in instinctively by what's going on. What has become of this revolution that he was part of the founding of. And yet he can't express what he feels. Because the vocabulary isn't available to him. If God does not exist, this is what Cursor is spelling out, then everything is permitted because there's no one to say nay or yea or to pass any judgments. If materialistic science is true, then of course God does not exist. And if materialistic science is true, then everything is permitted. That's the logic. Take another example. No Country for Old Men. Anyone seen this film? I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. It's, it's a very violent, nasty film. But in some sense, it is worth watching. Just to see how it spells out again the logical conclusion of real materialism. It's a story about a, a drug peddling and about the, the way in which the proceeds of that are, are hidden. And the, the main character of the film, Anton... Uh, played by Javier Bardem, as I remember, if I remember correctly. Hey, there he is. It's, um, that's Antoine on the, the right there in the uh, name of the film, who is a mass murderer and is after the proceeds from drug trafficking, which he eventually tracks down and just kills anyone who gets in his way, including the husband of Carla, 
It was shown there on the, the uh, left. And when he killed her husband, who had you know, got his way and was going to prevent him, get him arrested, uh, he promised her husband before he killed him that he would go and find his wife and kill her too. And we get to the point near the end of the film where he actually tracks down the man's wife. And uh, this is a conversation that then ensues. Carla, you don't have to do this. You know, he's about to shoot her. They say you don't have to do this. Carla, you don't. Okay. He flips a coin. In fact, uh, if you've seen the film, you know that that's what he always does. If he's not sure what to do, he just flips a coin and decides that way. Anton, this is the best I can do. Call it. I knowed you was crazy when I saw you sitting there. I knowed exactly what was in store for me. Call it. No, I ain't going to call it. Call it. The coin don't have no say, it's just you. Well, I got here the same way the coin did. It's all chance, isn't it, in the end? Staggering. But that's materialism. And that's the implicit position of a lot of what goes on in education, media, society today. Not spelt out, never declared explicitly, but implicitly that's the assumption that's there. That's, you know, there's only sky above us. But th that's all film and storybooks and all the rest of it. Does it influence people in the real world? Well, you know, that's, of course, back to where we started. Eric Harris, the Columbine killer. In fact, as far as I can tell, it's true of all of the people who've done these mass school mergers you know, around the world in recent years. When you, uh, for those for whom there is information on, on where this thinking came from. As I say, Eric was one of the two boys who shot 12 students and a teacher at Columbine High School in Colorado, 25th or 1999. And, and there's that statement I, I gave you at the beginning. Only maths and science are true. Everything else is man-made. And uh, you know, ask again that question, where, how did Eric learn that? Where did he get it from? You know, education and the media are never neutral. You know, as you go back in history, you realise that after the Second World War, many of the leaders of Europe were determined that the only way to avoid something like the Nazi catastrophe again was to have a, a fully secular society. Because what they didn't realise is that even secularism is not a neutral, non-religious position. And found, as we've learned to our cost since, that it's in fact a pr an even more dangerous position than the supposedly religious ones it replaced. Eric absorbed materialism and concluded that truth and morality were simply people's opinions that he could choose to accept or reject. And he rejected them. Don't let your mum and daddy tell you that violence and blood are wrong. Only science and maths are true. Everything else is opinion. So where does the blame lie? Well, Jeffrey Dahmer, American serial killer who murdered and dismembered 17 young men and boys, in some cases eating parts of their body. We think of cannibalism as something that happened back then over there. Yet there have been quite a lot of examples of cannibalism in America, in Canada, in Europe in the last few decades. Here's one, Jeffrey Damon. Well, he was another who killed himself. But so in the program, he was, this interview took place with his parents. It was a Larry King show, which is the Larry that's referred to here. This is what his father said. He felt that he was up, up from the slime, as he put it, you know, molecules to me was to Larry type of thing, evolution. That there was nothing, no direction by God, no one to be accountable to, no one to answer to at all. Above us, only 
sky. And then, you know, just a minute, more recently still, there was the German cannibal. Um, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce his name, so I won't attempt it, but uh, Armin. Who advertised on the internet for someone to eat. Unbelievable. And someone volunteered and was killed and partly eaten. Staggering. It, it gave the German courts a real headache. Because, strictly speaking, there was no law against consensual con cannibalism. And they had to change the law. This is Marty Sari, just a few weeks ago, in Finland, uh, who, at, uh, I won't try to pronounce it, a college, high school, as we'd call it, in Finland, just the 23rd of September, just over a month ago, killed 10 students. And it was clearly a copycat killing of, a, of one which happened less than a year before uh, from this man, Pekka Erik Ovinen, only 18, who at Jokela High School in Finland, 7th November last year, killed eight students on a rampage. And uh, Matti Sari this year was clearly copying it almost to a T. Uh, I haven't yet seen on the internet um, if they've discovered anything about Marty Sari, but Pekka Erik Ovinen, uh, you know, had websites and journals and all sorts, so there's plenty of information available there. And here's the kind of things he was writing you know, shortly before that massacre. I, as a natural selector, will eliminate all who I see as unfit, disgraces of human race, failures of natural selection. Humanity is overrated. It's time to put natural selection and survival of the fittest back on tracks. I am the law, judge, and executioner. There is no higher authority than me. You know, tremendous echoes of both Darwin and Nietzsche in those statements. The bother's only sky. Now, thankfully, the vast majority of people, uh, you know, absorb that material as if you don't go out and do anything. Um, Obviously, there are other factors involved. In fact, the clear one seems to be that all of these people, it seems, were on particular kinds of prescription drugs which are known to have psychotic effects in some individuals. So that might possibly be what you know, was the final thing that drove these students to, those, to that particular working out of those materialist conclusions. But materialist conclusions were a vital part in, the, in that jigsaw. So is there nothing credulous about secular materialism? You might wonder how you know, that goes back to that question asked at the beginning. Because my title actually was, of course, Is Atheism Compatible with Science? And really all I've been looking at is the fact that science is something that is carried out by free, rational people. People who are free to follow the logic of an argument to a conclusion. No one has ever yet been able to demonstrate how a chemical machine can possibly do that. So I would suggest no, science is not compatible with atheism. Because science requires scientists. Scientists are individuals with free will, able to follow moral principles, able to communicate, etc. And that materialistic framework just has no place for that kind of individual. <laughs>